Welcome to Middle Fingers Up, the show where we hold our heads high and our middle fingers higher. I'm your host, Kieran McKay. <laughs> I have to start laughing right off the bat because my guest, who I cannot wait to introduce, just uh, threw his middle fingers up. So I know how this is going to go already. Uh, I was going to start with today's episode is a special one, and it certainly is because today is about reconnecting with someone from our past, a friend that we haven't spoken to in years. And, you know, this happens. I think a lot of people listening will probably relate to this. Life takes us on separate paths. But the beauty of friendship is its ability to withstand the test of time. And joining us today is a dear friend I've known for over 20 years, uh, Mike Siebel. So we're going to just unmute you now and welcome you now because I want to have the rest of this conversation with you. So welcome. Thank you. I'm super excited, happy, elated to be here. And yes, I can't believe it's been 20 years. That blows my mind. Like, where did the time go? Of course, COVID time war sucks out a lot of those <laughs> years. But uh, yeah, it feels like yesterday we were hitting the clubs in Calgary, <laughs> dancing and showing our moves. So, I know, uh, man, the moves. <laughs> we had we had moves. I I. <laughs> Think about some of those 2000s jams that I still will play when I dance in my living room. And you're one of the the friends that connects to those those years of listening to those yeah. Mary J. Blige songs and <laughs> yes. Destiny's Child. And we're like at the, the local clubs dancing it up. And, you know, yeah. I, I think that's the that's that's the thing I was so excited about and couldn't wait to for today is reconnecting with you. We said it's been so long. I think we were trying to before we started this, how many years has it actually been? And I don't like you said, COVID and all that. I don't we don't know exactly um, but it might be close to 10 years that we haven't really sat in a room together and nah. had a conversation. So today is going to be a delight uh, because not only are we catching up, I also wanted to bring you on and talk about some things that have been on some of our previous guests' mind, listeners' minds, my mind, just about people in the community of a coming out as a young child. So you're a gay man. You also have talked about through our friendship about your own body image issues growing up as a young person. And, you know, again, the world of a man is a little different at times when it comes to these things in a world of a woman, let alone some of the more complex ways to identify today. And I say complex because there's a lot of people that are struggling with understanding how young people are identifying today. I don't know if the young people would say it's complex. I'm not sure. Uh, so I thought, okay, you know what? We haven't had an opportunity to have a voice for, as you would say, someone from the 2SL LGBTQ+. Did I say it right? I had to write it down. Isn't that bad? But I did. did. Um, yeah, community. Did. And so like, I'm, I'm excited to have your take. But in the midst of all that, the best part is like two friends getting to just talk you know it's been a yeah. while yeah. it's been way too long for sure so i'm so glad that you do this podcast oh. and i started listening and i was like oh my god when you sent the message hey i want you to be on the show i like i'm pretty sure i like had to take a step back because i was like oh my god <laughs> like this is so surreal <laughs> so <laughs> i was doing my research as i thought okay when i have a good friend on I often don't do a whole lot of notes because it's the flow of a conversation. But because we were going to talk about yep. some of these heavier topics, I thought, you know, obviously I should do my part and prepare. Uh, and then I was like, you know what? I should go online and see, like, what are some questions you would first ask a friend that you haven't seen in years to catch up with? And so it's like all these I don't know, thoughtful questions. And I wrote a couple down. But in the end, I went with the original one that I thought of that I was like, well, I just want to ask you, you miss me? It's been like, how many years? So that's, that's, that's the question. Did you miss me? That's where we're going to start. Yes. <laughs> I love it. And yes, of course, I missed you. And it's one of those things where I think we mentioned this earlier, but, you know, a, a true if I can say this, the true friendship is one where you can have a lot of time in between, but when you reconnect, it's like there was no time that passed where you weren't in connection. Yeah. And 
And that's how I feel with you. And so that's why, you know, there's no bitterness to like, oh my God, why didn't you call me? Or yeah. like, I, you know, you know that we got married yeah. and, and you didn't know about yeah. it. And yeah. so like, yeah, right? I'm Terrible. Sure I know. Like, you're surprised, <laughs> but not, I hate you. Yeah. Now. Like, we're not, we're cutting this show short. <laughs> like, this is bullshit. Like, <laughs> yeah. Fuck you. I mean, bring, make you bring your husband in and be like, fuck you, man. No, yeah, not yeah. at all. Quite the opposite. And I think that's, that's just it. It's like, if you're lucky enough, to be blessed with a friend like you that you connect with. And I think that's the other thing is like talking about how we connected. But you connect with someone and and you maintain that relationship. And like you said, it ebbs and flows. Things happen. I had kids. You got married. You moved. We were trying to figure out when you lived in one part of Alberta. Then you moved to the other. And now you're in a whole different province of Canada here. So it's like okay, there's so much has happened. And maybe maybe that's one of the things we do is a little highlight reel. So if you could think of like top five highlights of if Cam was here and my brother was going to do his top five thing that he does, maybe he would say, yeah. what are the top five things in the last however many years that we haven't seen each other that you would, you'd want to share? Because what we talked about earlier was instead of saying, what have you been up to? We, you know, you yeah. really like the question you mentioned, how have you grown? So maybe that yeah. can be sort of the, well, yeah, what, what are some ways that you've grown top five things that have happened for you that I wouldn't know? Absolutely. Yeah. So, oh my God, five. five yeah, that, that is a lot. I know like, if, you, if you're like, I can't. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I could do it, but I don't always listen to the rules. So there might be like <laughs> seven or eight, no, five. So 5.5, 5. 5, 5. 5.6. <laughs> I guess the first one would be, so I moved away back to Edmonton. So got like, you know, a, a job that I'm still in with a company I really enjoy. And I get to use my degree, which was in nutrition and became a dietitian, which has been great. So that that's one highlight. The next highlight would be meeting my husband now, but at the time, you know, the man of my dream. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so that would be another highlight. So meeting him, moving in together. We got a dog. Aww. He loves dogs. I grew up with a dog and she's just so precious. And I know we'll get into this, but before we got her, a little side story, uh, first tangent of our of our podcast <laughs> together. I love um, the tangent. When we before we got the dog, we already had the name picked out. Oh. And the name is RuPaul. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yes. like, who else could it be? We're just like, that's like the most perfect name to name a dog. <laughs> of course, we just call her Ru, oh, which is yeah. so adorable, right? Yeah. And are you? So, yeah. So we would be walking, I don't know, going from one place to another, and we'd see a dog, and we'd be like, is that RuPaul? Where's RuPaul? Like, where are we going to find her? <laughs> and anyways, so then we got Ru, and that's been a joy. And I know we were talking about, because you had a dog for the longest yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You remember Cassie? There are some struggles. It's not all mm. roses and like rainbows and that sort of thing. So yeah, she drives me crazy too. But that would be a, a highlight as well, getting our dog. And then of course, getting married Yeah, would be the next highlight. And that was a lot of fun. We did like a bit of a kind of like a drag-ish number, like a a flash mob kind of dance at our wedding to Dem Beats by Todd Rakal. Oh so that my was, gosh. Yeah. I'm still so, at the uh, flash yeah. mob. Like, was it a drag <laughs> flash mob? Well, we were in thigh high hooker boots mm. with like, you know, platform five inch stiletto mm. kind of heels. So it was fun. I'm sure I can find the video. I'll send it to you so you can see it. Yes. It was a blast. People had a lot of fun. So yeah, so that that was it. And then I think the most obvious one now, like you said, we're in a different province. So after partly through COVID, we decided to move and we moved to Montreal. So now we're in uh, the land of cheese curds and <laughs> smoked meat, <laughs> which is, uh, which is good. Yeah. I like it. So, yeah. Yeah. So we've been here for two years now. So do you think you're living in been... your forever home now and like Montreal no. will be your forever place or you will you move? I so. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Like the move was for work just yeah. to kind of continue to, you know, move in my career, if you will. But, the longer you're away and the older you get, the more you realize, and this is so cliche and like people are going to be gagging and rolling their eyes <laughs> when they hear this, but oh, not home is where the heart is, but it's where the people that matter to you are. Like, mm -hmm. so a lot of my family, pretty much all my family is back in Alberta, like Edmonton area. And 
most of our friends are, right? And Sean has some family there. So he has other family that's around the GTA area. So that's been kind of the trade-off, which has been really nice. Um, So we traded my family for his. So that way my mom can get mad at me like, well, you know, it's only fair that yeah. we go near Sean's family too. So yeah, so all that to be said, the question originally is, is this our forever home? I don't I don't see it being our, our forever yeah. home, but the city is amazing. There's just so much to do and see. And I thought like Edmonton had a lot of culture and it does for the size of the city, but like Montreal just blows it out of the water. I like bet. there is too much too much to do here so and lots of culture which is great and different cultures that maybe you're not as exposed to depending on where you live Mm. which is amazing because it's all about you know learning about other people their experiences and their food is like a nice thing that comes along with it and language too let me tell you a tangent number five (laughs) i love it (laughs) i just love i could listen to you talk all day by the way (laughs) careful that might happen uh (laughs) But moving here as like a, what would it be, like unilingual person, and I would say the average for most people here is that they're trilingual. Mm -hmm. So they speak French, they speak English, and then they've also likely immigrated from somewhere else now. So they have a third language. And I like the complex that you get when you think you know shit. And then you move somewhere and you can't even speak the other official language of Canada, which is French, let alone like your cultural background language or you know what I mean? And and boy, oh boy, have I ever had a lot of humble pie mm. <laughs> with that. It blows my mind. Like yeah. It's so crazy. I never would have expected that. And I'm so my eyes are like popping up. I'm so glad to hear you say that because it really takes someone especially a white person right like you you're your north america is your place you've claimed it it's your home i'm not saying you but i'm saying white people yeah. and for yeah. there's very little room for people of color and when when you are sitting here saying yeah you're moving to another province where the language and first of all french so a lot of people coming to canada english is the language and so so many people don't know it you know my mom's lived yeah. here for over 40 years and her english is not perfect it's not her first language she can get by and she does a decent job but you know she did her she she's been supporting pronouns you know and the whole he's and she's and they's all her life and she gets them all mixed up you know my sister's been a he yeah. all her life and it's just we laugh but it's it's not easy to learn and i think so yeah. many people do don't have the experience understanding what it's like unless if they're a person of color they're having to learn English so to hear you say that moving to Montreal I think that is so cool that you got to experience oh wait a minute I'm being humbled here I have to figure out how to communicate and learn and hopefully people that live in in Montreal are being patient with you because yeah. you're, you're eager <laughs> you're interested you're a newcomer whatever it is right and because otherwise yeah. it's it's hard on both ends in that way where yeah. sure you hope somebody you know that's serving you at a restaurant can speak the language yeah. but at the same everyone's learning everyone's figuring it out and can we have a little bit of patience with whoever it is that's not getting it on the first try you know so i really thought i'd highlight that highlight because that's cool for me to hear you say holy fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally well and there's so many nuances that, within that itself so when you come to montreal montreal is very bilingual like not even bilingual just like very cultural yeah right so you can get a buy really anywhere with english when you move here it's different because a lot of the red tape or the bureaucracy is in French and you have to request it in English. And and that's okay. Cause like, that's a whole other level. If you could get your French to the point of like understanding how to renew your mortgage and all this other crap in French is like, no, not even doing it in English is hard. So I can't even imagine in a different. (laughs) Seriously. I agree. So, but then bringing it back to, so you try and speak French, but anyone who speaks French here, if they, can tell that French isn't your first language, even if you're speaking French. And this happens to my husband, Sean. He took French immersion for quite a while. And I I know there's the argument, well, people can take French immersion and they can have varying levels of proficiency in a language after immersion. This was pretty good and he can get by. He just did an interview recently in French and got the job, oh, wow. which blows my mind. And I'm so proud of him for that. But even for him, when he speaks French, people will switch to English. And, and so there's this nuance of, well, they want to pre- preserve the language, right? Which makes complete sense. 
but if you're trying to learn and people keep switching on you, it's hard. But the part that I took five minutes for me to get to is why should it be on everyone that works here to also then become the French teacher, yeah. right? To yep. have to be on the struggle bus with you while you're learning the yeah. language and they have to struggle and like get frustrated. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. I can appreciate why they would want to just switch and be like, fuck it. I'll it's just do just it for easier. you. Here you go. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, yeah, you can see both sides of that. So where, where would you see, where does the compassion lie? being an almost like an outsider moving into a new culture like where would you say yeah people are most compassionate about this well i mean i would say for myself it's a few things number one just acknowledge the feelings that you have so i'll get frustrated i'll get pissy but then i go mike you moved here get with it right yeah. like this yeah. is you just have to put in the work you can't just rely on your privilege nor should you yeah. you need to you know, put in the effort like everyone else has to. And also that just adds that layer of, okay, now when I see someone and I like, and I truly believe that I've been really empathetic and supportive anyways, like when I lived in Alberta, if someone didn't speak English very well, I never got mad. Yeah. Like I just, I was supportive, but yeah. it just adds this whole other layer. Like for me, you know, when you walk a mile in someone's shoes, that's when you really yes. get the shit that's going on. Right. And even then, like, you'll never get all of it, but it's just so profound. So, and for other people, they just, I keep hearing this all the time. People just appreciate it. If you try, yeah. they know you're not going to get it, but if you put in some effort, mm -hmm. they know that you are, you know, you're trying yes. and that's that human trader quality that you kind of alluded to at the beginning, right? We're yeah. all human and Absolutely. Yeah, I, that's so. that's well said. So when we were counting your highlights, did we have? Did, was that three or four? Was there one more Ooh. we need to throw in? Because we had. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll throw one more in. I yeah. feel like. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I, and this might be a topic we talk about this time, but I was really lucky to meet some really good friends back in Edmonton who were also drag queens. Oh. And so they kind of took me under my wing and my husband was a huge supporter of this in letting me get into drag. And it was something I didn't even realize I wanted to do. And like, this could be a whole tangent for a whole show, but he gave me like one of the best birthday gifts ever. And that was before I started doing drag, but we had all these drag friends who were pretty like, renowned within the Edmonton drag scene or used to be anyways, you know, because generations come and go, but he got everyone to contribute money and they put together a like starter drag kit for me. Like, so all this different makeup and it was so cool. And part of it is, you know, well, you wouldn't necessarily know this, but in the community, people who do drag can sometimes be perceived a certain way and are maybe there's just less options for them in terms of finding a partner. Because, oh, I don't I don't want to, like, I'm a gay man. I don't want to date a man who dresses like a woman. And you know what I mean? And they're, like, that's not really what drag is. It's, it's a lot more than that. But anyways, I just found that, like, such an amazing gift to go out of his way and support something where, in my mind, I'm like, this could make you not like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I did it a lot, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, anyways, that's so. that. You know, you were asking me earlier, like, oh, you know, we've been married five years, you guys 15. Like, what's the thing? But it doesn't matter five years, 15 years, however many years, like right there. That's a pretty stable relationship. And that's like part of building a foundation where you have space for your own individualities. And sometimes yeah. when we find a partner, we sort of think we all we have to do walk the exact same road and be on the same path. And I think some ways, sure, hopefully our marriage values or relationship values are similar. But in lots of other ways, we're still we, we started without each other. And so like, can we not have the space to be the individual that I am, whether you know, in the, in the way that you talk about drag, and we are going to talk more about drag today. It is one of our topics. And we'll see if we like we talked about earlier, are we gonna have to do a different session on it um, because I want to know that's when I remember on our timeline of like when I started to kind of reconnect with you through social media was when you guys moved mm -hmm. to Montreal bought the place and then all of a sudden I start seeing pictures of you in drag and yep. I'm like, first of all, why is this motherfucker more good looking than me in drag? <laughs> that's my first thing. Like, why are you so hot? 
Um, but the, oh, but for real, I was like, oh, true. holy fuck. I'm like, this is crazy. This is amazing. And I need to know how Mike got here because like you said, it's not, drag is not your identity. You no. know, you, there's a lot of space in there. And the guy that I knew all these years ago and the guy that I'm wanting to get to know again, there's a story there of how, how you got there. And that's cool that you have a partner that supports you finding no. this spark that you're trying to bring to yeah. light right and you're not harming anyone so wh yeah, why well, not well well we'll get there maybe you are that's the question is mike yeah, yeah. harming anyone right now with this yeah no doubt right like fuck but we'll get there okay so i'm going to just for a second pause because we did highlights hopefully we did five and i just want to go to the middle finger segment because then i'd like to talk a little bit with you about your life growing up. And so before we get there, why don't we start with uh, what do you want to put your middle fingers up to today? Well, yeah. Okay. So this is something I've been thinking about for a while, ever since you asked me to be on, you said, PS, <laughs> How, you know, be prepared to, you know, flip the bird to some <laughs> things. And the one thing that keeps coming to mind, and I think it would be uh, amiss if we didn't at least acknowledge what's going on in the world right now, you know, with a lot of clashing and fighting and, and um, I won't understand it completely. I'm trying to learn more, but I think there's misinformation out there and social media makes it easier to reinforce your own thoughts, your own beliefs. So kind of being in your own echo chamber, which just makes people more, I guess, strongly, they just believe strongly in, in what they're doing. And, and so my middle finger is up is both hands. So one middle finger is to just the perpetuation of uh, mindsets and thoughts uh, and just reinforcing narrow mindedness, mm -hmm. you know, finding the I'm trying to think of the word now it's it's confirmation mm, bias confirmation so, bias where you okay look, yes you look for everything that supports your narrative oh, right yes. so yeah. Yeah. you might dismiss the 90% that is contrary to what you think but yeah. uh so so i think just that being so prolific and easy to find and to you know confirm your own biases yeah and then the other is just some of the dismissive culture out there mm. you know so for example just because i'm a white male a lot of people might say well you don't have a voice well i do have a voice please don't dismiss it it doesn't mean i should use it all the time mm. i should listen more i should learn more but if you dismiss someone you're not helping the conversation and having everyone move forward yeah we don't want to make anyone feel less than lots of people cultures have been felt less than for many years right and that's horrible but that doesn't mean you should make other people feel less than so that you have space. So I think it's the, it kind of fits in with empathy. It fits in with just like human traits. So it's the dismissiveness. Yeah. And and it isn't just that example. There's other ones too, you know, whether you're, I don't even want to say it because I know that it's very polarizing right now, mm. but depending on what side, if you believe in a side, mm -hmm. you know, you'll automatically be called certain things. Mm -hmm. But a perfect thing is, you know, if you have an issue, Kieran, with like, let's say something in the LGBTQ plus community or to us LGBTQ plus community, it doesn't automatically make you homophobic. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing, like, that's the example I can use because it's a space that I identify with and, and belong to. We can't just call you homophobic because you don't agree with something that happens in the community. There, there could be good reason for it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that happens in other spaces too. And I think we're so quick to cancel or dismiss, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's important to just step back and think about it for a second. Yeah. You know? I like, I think you did a great job. You had a few middle fingers uh, in there. And yeah. I, and I think, what, yeah, I yeah, just like, boom, 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 right? Like pew, pew, pew. Um, that's how I shoot my gun. And my boys are like, mom, stop it. That's how my gun sounds. Too. Right? Pew, pew, pew. pew. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I hear you talking about is 
starting at the beginning of a story and i think i think often you're right if if we're searching for our validation in our own beliefs and we're searching for reminders of the stuff that maybe we don't want to learn more be curious about and grow about that that's you know everyone's own choice of how we choose to live and grow and where how we view growth and all that um but i what i hear you really saying is when we do plug into topics and sometimes hot topics and certain topics that are going on right now, like the war overseas, you know, drag and all sorts of different, you know, there's a lot of people from your community that are Muslim that are getting in a lot of unsafe situations. Like they're not getting into it. They're being put into these. And so there's lots of these topics out there that we all are watching on social media and we all either are living it, experiencing it, somehow we're being impacted. And I hear you saying that the key is starting at the beginning of a lot of these stories. And I show up on social media today. I have to remember that I whatever's being posted before me is just part of a story. And I think it's all of our responsibility to back it up and get to the beginning. Just like when we meet a partner or a friend and we say, this is a me you're learning about today. But in order to really understand me, I should tell you about my childhood. I had a great childhood or I experienced trauma or whatever, because these are things that I'm bringing along. And I think when we look at the war and all the things that are happening over there, we're getting sucked into the, you're right, the sexiness, the social media piece. And we're not looking at what are the things that happened in the beginning and how did, how did a lot of this happen? And at the end of the day, we're talking about humans and what, what, what can we do to help humans that are suffering? And, you know, like, our time might come too, yeah. right? And and when we're suffering, whether it's because the world is falling apart or whether it's in our own homes or break, breaking apart or relationships, we only hope that as humans, someone's there to, you know, lend a hand and say, I got yeah. you, right? And and so I, I really I appreciate what you're saying about understand, you know, where you're, where you're coming from and understand what people are putting out there. And, and also like, thank you for saying, yeah, you're not, you're not homophobic or you're not racist or you're not this big label if you're being curious and asking a question or someone has a you're a white man and I'm a you know South Asian woman and you have a problem with me it's not because you're racist it's probably because it's a inter intrapersonal thing so also getting clear about that like I appreciate you saying that too because I think we're all worried about offending and yet that's what we keep doing because we don't know how to be curious and you know I had a really good friend recently say to me she's like there's a difference between being quiet and listening and she's like I'm not being quiet in this conversation I'm listening because we were we were two women of color are talking. She's she's not a woman of color. And one of the women asked her like, hey, like, sorry, like we're kind of taking over this conversation. Like, what's your thought about, about what we're talking about? Because you seem quiet. And this friend, she's white. She's like, oh, I'm glad you asked because I'm not being quiet right now. I'm listening and I'm trying to find yep. space to, to bring safety to this so that you can tell me your experience mm-hmm. as a black woman. And all I can do is, offer listening and we love that her this other woman and i were like oh my god i've never had any anyone say that of the difference between being quiet and listening right and and i like i feel like that's what i'm hearing you say too is yeah like can we just take a breath for a second and slow down when we're interacting as humans yeah absolutely i I, and i mean i think it goes even further to think about it's not always that you're going to understand it, right? So you may never understand it. And why? Because your background and your experiences aren't the same as mine yeah. or vice versa, right? So I may never be able to understand or, or I don't know if agree is the right word, but I need to be okay with trusting you that the way that you perceive it is true and is real. And I just have to be okay with it. Yeah. I don't have to get it. Yeah. Right. Because people are not going to get everyone's experiences or histories yeah. and, and that sort of thing. But we have to start to get a, get to a point where we can trust that that's your story. Yeah. That's your experience. And it's valid. Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to agree with everything, yeah. but we honor it, we respect it. And then we take that as information and we move forward. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, when I used to work with young people that were 
uh, experienced a lot of trauma, had a lot of cognitive deficits. And often when, when anyone experienced working with young people with cognitive deficits, there's their, the brain's not developed in a way that the brain understands how to plan and respond. So there's a lot of emotional and reactive responses. So the young people can be violent. And something, some of the work that we would do as staff when we would experience this violence was, you know, when we go to do this process with this, this, this child that we're working with, validating them. Be, you know, they, they they smacked me, they punched me because they were scared of something, let's say. So validating okay. that fear that they had isn't agreeing with the fact that they were violent. And and sometimes that's hard for us to understand that if I validate you and say, Mike, you know, I what I hear you saying right now is it's complicated being a man in the place that you're at right now in life and you're trying to figure that out. And, you know, if I if I'm validating you, I can walk away from there not agreeing with you. I can walk away from there being like, this guy doesn't fucking know, you know, like not to say that I would, but whatever. Like I don't, I don't have to say to you that I disagree because how am I right or wrong? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? That's now my perception against yours. And I, I really appreciate what you're saying, which is we can validate each other and it's okay. That doesn't mean that I'm agreeing and giving up my voice when I say I can understand what that would be like for you. Yeah. And that's hard. I find yeah. that really hard because I'm so, my personality and my, my nature is to want to agree with people and to find common ground and to share that. And, and so that is one of my biggest challenges right now yeah. is to continue to be able to make someone feel seen and heard, but it doesn't mean I agree with you. Yeah. Right. And it's okay to disagree. Like if we look back in history even just at like politics, and I don't know a lot about politics, but what I know is that now the groups are very against each other. Whereas before they might, you know, not be agreeing with each other, but they would go out for a drink after or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they'd find some ground. They would like, we're both human. We both have families or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we can have differences and still be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. That kind of goes back to this whole, now we're in a world where people like to be behind a screen more and Mm -hmm. you can confirmation bias all you want. But I think it's more important to have people in your circle that you don't agree with because it keeps you, I don't know if in check is the right word, but it just gives you exposure to other thoughts and beliefs. Because I'm not better than anyone. Totally. So the way I think, as much as I'm like, well, it'd just be easy if everyone thought the way that I thought. <laughs> and agreed, right? Yeah, it what you really want is not, you know, but yeah. no, I, you're right. I love going back to your original point is, yeah, the best way to grow is having challenges or challenging opinions or pe- loved ones that we feel safe with that are going to have our back by saying, you know what, Kieran, I'm not sure when you say that. That's the best way to get that out there. I hear what you're saying and I feel for you. How is that any better or wh- whatever? Like I would hope that my loved ones have my back and and I would hope that they would see the same with me when I call them up and say, you know, when we had that interaction that day, I, I wonder if that person left feeling this way or what, and maybe we need to go back. You know, my sister and I was talking about that. Like she's probably one of the best persons out there that I can give so much feedback. I'm the oldest sister, so you can understand what that might be like for her as a middle child. But I can give her a lot of feedback, a lot of observations, and she's taught me how to do it in a way that she's going to want to hear it too. But she can take so much feedback from people and not respond in a defensive way and really be open to, and she doesn't have to commit. It's like a consultation. She doesn't have to commit to it. You know, when you go to a a beauty bar and you consult for your hair and you don't have to go get the hair done, right? Well, but you know what I mean? Ways. Like, yeah, like I think, you know, she's very open to the, the receiving the feedback. And I, I really am influenced by that a lot because that's hard for me to take. But to see someone that's able to do that, I think is great. And I, yeah, I think we can learn from the people around us yeah. that are pushing us and challenging us. So, so do you have any other M- MFUs before we move on? No, I'm going to leave it at that for now because okay. I don't want to come across as someone who's like just like angry at the world. Oh. <laughs> Although, having said that, I don't have any other off the top of my head. Anyways, no, but, and uh, you're not angry at the world. I appreciate how you're talking. I think no. one of the most in my world, I said this to you at the beginning, right? Like you, you know what it's like to be a human and treat people human to human. And I think we should share the story before we move on how we met. 
because people will people will hear what I mean in this. So can I I'll start it. If you want to change or add anything, go for it. But this is how I remember this story. So Mike and I used to we met working at a facility where young adults with autism lived. This was their home. Yes. And I got a casual job, which meant I worked weekends and all sorts of weird hours, but it was a weekend part-time job. So I was the weekend staff on, part-time staff. And your job, as you talked about earlier, your background was nutrition, dietitian. Your job, well, you were the chef. So you would come in on the weekends and cook meals, right? Yeah. Also part-time, also, just like you yeah. on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, this is where we meet. <laughs> and usually the side that I worked on wasn't your side. You were on the side where the kitchen was. But for some reason, I ended up having to go work a shift on your end. And I saw you walking out of your tiny little kitchen area to the pantry or whatever, grabbing stuff. And, and, you know, full disclosure, my husband knows this story. And at the time, my husband, Carrie, and I were together. And I was like, damn, this guy's so hot. Oh, my gosh. And oh, my gosh, this hot guy just smiled at me. Like, that is so nice. Makes me feel very seen. And oh, wow, this is so kind. Oh, the hot guy's still smiling at me. This is really nice. Oh, my gosh. Then the hot guy starts talking to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy is so hot. And now he wants to talk to me. Like, this is so cool. Like whoever wants to talk to me, that's amazing. And, you know, Carrie and I moved out here a few months prior and we didn't know anyone. We didn't really have anyone. And I think for me, like when you were smiling and talking or like saying hi and reaching out at the time, was just like this first moment of belonging because we didn't, I didn't know anyone at all. And so yeah. it just does not take much for someone to just look at you and smile. And it was so kind. You did that. But I thought you were hot and I thought you were hitting on me because I also have an ego, right? I'm 20 something <laughs> and uh, not much has changed, but still. And anyways, we start talking and like, what it, I don't know how long into the conversation you dropped that you were gay. Like, that's how I found out you were, you had talked about yeah. being gay. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I don't even know if I told you at that time that this whole time we were talking, I thought that you were like this guy that was hitting on me. And I didn't even want to think about how I'm going to break to you that I'm with Carrie, but I definitely was <laughs> loving this whole thing. And, you know, as as we got talking and we laughed about, no, like, there's no, you know, feelings in that way. Truly, truly, I was like, holy crap, this guy all along just genuinely wanted to smile at me. And he just genuinely wanted to, like, say hi. And he genuinely just wanted to talk. Like, that was, like, such a cool learning experience for me, A, with the opposite sex, but also, like, B, to, like, meet someone that I don't know. I don't know anyone out here. You know, you just start to think, oh, like... It's hard to make friends. You're moved to a foreign place and you extend this smile and this warmth. And like, we just, we hit it off. And then we had nicknames yeah. for each other, right? We did have nicknames. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because you were teaching me yeah. Hindi, right? Punjabi. Was it Hindi? Yeah. Punjabi. Punjabi. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was. I was yeah. teaching you with, yeah. with yeah. all of your ingredients. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 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 we our nicknames for each other were Alu and Gajar. Yeah. God Gajar was carrot and Alu yeah. was potato. And pretty much for years now we have called each other Alu and the name they change. Sometimes one's Gajar. So we just started. Whoever says Gajar, yes. then the other one automatically says, Hey Alu. And whoever says Alu, yeah, yeah. that one's like, Oh hey Gajar, what's up? So, <laughs> well carrot and potato over here. <laughs> yeah. Which is it's cute in English, but it's way cuter in Punjabi. It is, it is. My, my little Alu, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Oh, yeah. And then from there, friendship just started. We started yeah. hanging out. You can't, You met Carrie. Carrie loved you. Yeah. And you and I would just go and party together. We would we would go yep. for drinks. We would go dance. We, we would just hang out. And, you know, that's sort of how all of this started it, at the beginning was just this connection of you being such a kind soul. And, and I loved when you were on shift because I'd find a way to be on that side and just talk to you. And I don't quite remember the details, but I I do remember the meaning, just the feeling of like, oh, it's so much fun to just connect with you and talk to you about whatever it was going on for you or me and, or, you know, venting about something that was challenging that happened on shift. It was just, it was a lovely, lovely um, way to, I think, meet someone and, and be able to carry this kind of friendship over the years that today we can sit together and say, yeah, I agree that we can have people in our lives that challenge us and push us and say, hey, 
maybe that's not the way to go about that and what. And you're one of those people that I, I look up to and yeah. I appreciate all these years, you know, still wow. being able to connect in the way that we can today. So I know big hearts, heart emoji right here. <laughs> I know, hearts. I know if I could yes. hug you, I just would just Thank squeeze you. you. Oh my God. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Is that um, how you remembered it? It, yeah, absolutely. Like we met at the facility and you popped in and you were just like full of energy. It was like a ray of sunshine that just like popped in. And I was like, oh my God, she's so awesome. <laughs> how could I not smile at you? But it's funny how you say, I've, I've heard this before and maybe this is my own like confirmation biases going on. But, you know, you hear the saying that you don't remember what people say, but you remember how they made you feel, yeah. right? And so that's just it. Like I remember, I don't remember all of the stuff we talked about for sure, but I remember how I was felt with you and that was safe and yeah. heard and seen and like welcomed. And we just had, like, we just hit it off. Yeah. And it's cool when you have those connections that mm -hmm. it, you can't even explain it. It's just like it, it just works. Yeah. Yep. Right? It does. Yeah. And, and, and even before we started recording, we re reminisced about how, when Carrie and I got married in 2008, I invited you and you came out by yourself to Vancouver and you yeah. came out the week of and were part of like like all the festivities yeah. and made it to the wedding, made it to the reception. Usually by the reception, a lot of friends that haven't done this before are like tired and sick if the family <laughs> members aren't either, right? But yeah. you you pulled through and, you know, like you and I were talking about that. How did that even happen? Like the fact that you came out, but also by yourself, probably culture shock into a Vancouver foreign place, yet a wedding that you've never been part of before. A South Asian experience yeah. is fantastic, but it's always great to have someone there yeah. with you. And the only person you know is a bride and I'm busy. So yeah. it's so amazing yeah. that you just did all of that and put all those anxieties and worries of what may be or would come up for some of us away and like showed up. And yeah. I will forever remember, I will forever remember you, Mom. you being, and you were in pictures, like you were there. And it was just, it was so cool to have, have you part yes. of that time of my life and then get to connect with you at this time in the forties where I just feel a lot of growth and a lot of appreciation is is coming about, you know, like, I don't know about you, but yeah. this is a really nice era, this yeah. decade of, okay, like we gotta, we also gotta go back and nourish some of those relationships, but also yeah. what do we learn from them? Right. And you were just, yeah. you were, uh, you were such a strong part of our, our time when we got here and, um, and, you know, and here we are and here we are today, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that because as you're saying at this time, I'm thinking, if you just listen to the things I did, I'm like, wow, that is a lot. But at the time, it wasn't even a question. I just did it. You know what I mean? Like, it it wasn't like, oh, I have to do this. And then I have to do that. All these things that I would have to do to accomplish it. And I don't know if I told you, but I had just come back from a trip in Europe, like literally the weekend before. Yes. And then I oh, flew yeah. out. Like, and it's all coming back to me because, you know. Me too. <laughs> memory is like a little bit wavering but yeah it just made sense like I it, it wasn't even a question I was like of course and it didn't seem like a big deal or a you know a tall order to to fill so yeah. it's yeah. just all warm and fuzzies yeah all the good feeling totally warm fuzzies and it was a, you were a beautiful bride oh, oh my <laughs> oh. god and the culture of the of all of the ceremonies yeah. and yeah. remember you got carried up on a, I'm not sure what yeah, the, the dolly. Of it, but yeah. you had all the brothers and you're like this is like the first time this has happened yeah. i don't know if it was in your family in a while or yeah but i was just like oh my god this is so cool yeah, yeah 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 they my um so there's a there's a customs that that we bring from india and they're they're still held on to and followed but it translates different and so in india when you when the girl gets married, you're officially leaving your village, and often you don't go back until maybe you're going to have a baby or there are some unique circumstances. But most part, you don't. And so when after the ceremony, there's some rituals that the bride's family does to send her off, and it's kind of like forever now. And she's carried in a we call it a dolly, and it's like this beautiful built almost like you're in this like beautiful little box and it's all decorated with pillows and your brothers are carrying you on their shoulders and saying like, we got you, but also like, good luck and all the things in between. Yeah. And hopefully I'm translating this in a respectful way in my culture and is like, good job, girlfriend. 
And so we we when we do it here in Canada, we don't actually have the physical the doli that the girl like maybe some families would do it as like a fun little thing, but but the process still happens. You go back to the bride's house, you say bye, everyone's crying. It's you know all these things. And Carrie and I had been living together for seven years and like away from the family. So we're like, this is funny. We're gonna do this custom. And, you know, the joke is I'm like, we're all going to fake cry because I've been out of the house for so many years, Um, (laughs) which was weird because I actually cried my whole wedding weekend so much that my mother-in-law was like, do you even want to marry my son? And I was like, these are (laughs) these are just I don't know. It just became this emotional moment. Right. Like I just like, oh, yeah, shit, Uh this is actually legit happening. But, yeah, my brothers carried me in that dolly just down the street. And it was so cute that we had that and we did that. And joke about it all the time my sister's just like classic you you know and I'm like yeah I guess but yeah so you you got to be part of all those cool moments and a few more of those you know down the way now is we're as we're hitting the next the second act I call it after the 40s right no not the second (laughs) part one B (laughs) part one A (laughs) yeah we're gonna live to a hundred this is Oh, the 40s are the new 30s. Oh, oh, for sure. We're going out like Betty White, man. Like a couple, oh God, couple yes. months before the 100th as a joke. Like, fuck you guys, right? But oh. but scientists are now saying that they're doing a lot of work that the next generation may be able to live to like 120, 130. So I'm like, well, you know, like maybe maybe I can squeeze in there and take yeah. do what the young generation's doing. But people are like, oh, I don't want to live that long. And I'm like, fuck that, man. I want to live as long as like... If a vampire wants to make me a vampire, go ahead. I'll yeah. do it because I would love to live longer. <laughs> Seriously. Why aren't some of those folklores real? <laughs> I know, right? Okay. I'm going to do a middle finger segment too, okay? Yeah. So I've been thinking about this and it's a little bit of what we're going to talk and talk about. And so my middle fingers are up to unrealistic media standards. And you, you talked about in one way and mine is more about these... I want, and I'm hoping there's folks out there and we can do this together. Like we can start or continue because some people are ahead in this, but challenging those toxic norms and this whole unattainable beauty ideals that the media continues to throw away. And a friend sent a video the other day of like, you know, AI is doing all sorts of interesting things and everyone has mixed feelings about it. And one of the videos she was sending me was, these uh, Instagram influencers, are, there's so many that are created through AI, so they're not even real women. And so she sends me this, and it's like six or seven different Instagram, you know, influencers that you would follow and hate yourself over and hate your, you know, wow. think your body's got to look this way. And I was like, man, why are they all white girls too? Like, why can't they at least have, you know, like some brown girls or black girls? But at the same time, it's like we're we're still we're we're never going to end this little piece about the body and the beauty and we've been so obsessed from from day 1 about our bodies in terms of what we're supposed to look like, what we should look like, the billions of dollars of diets and you know all of that and what the what I really want to focus on though in all of that is I have had for years in my pantry a picture of I don't know, she's an uh, an actress and she's doing a yoga pose. She's on the beach. She's in a bikini and I have written above it, flat abs were made in the kitchen because I learned this years ago that how you get your flat abs. But I've had this picture posted for years and years and years. And, you know, you become immune to it. But in some ways, it's just always there. I have my fair share of body image stuff that I'm always working on. Some days are better than others. And yesterday I had really good friends over and one of our friends, he was helping Carrie make supper. And so he had to be in the pantry and all this. And I don't know if he's ever noticed it or if he's ever even been in our pantry. But he and his wife and I were talking later. And in mid conversation, he's like, and also Kieran, we need to take down that picture. And I was like, what picture? He's like, that woman, that woman you have. And I'm like, what woman? So he's like, the woman in your pantry. And I was like, what? <laughs> and his wife's like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that because she's a frequent visitor of my pantry and, you know, taking okay. cookies and stuff. <laughs> And, and she's like, and neither of us have talked about this. So her and her husband have not talked about this. And he, he's like, I just want to say, like, I was going to take it down for you, but I don't want to offend you. Like, we, we got, you can't think like that. You are so beautiful. And 
you work so hard. I know how hard you work with working out. And, you know, like you are far better than that picture right there. Like that is, you know, again, magazine, polish, whatever. We don't need to strive to be that way. Like where we are at, right? We need to put a picture. You need to put a picture of yourself up there. And it was just a moment of, I don't know, like overwhelmed with, again, that feeling of belonging and that I just was so not expected, didn't, was not needing to hear it, I thought, but definitely needed to hear it and really appreciated yeah. two friends um, of opposite sex talking to me about, we got, we got to get this out of our heads. We got to keep striving to not put, you know, get caught in what our bodies are supposed to be like and what we think we're supposed to be yeah. like when our bodies are giving us so much strength and health. So yeah. it's a long middle finger segment, but I just wanted to say like, cheers to those uplifting people in our life that, from time to time, we'll drop some of these little, you know, compliments or just day to day reminders of like, we we don't need that. Because no. listening to a friend say that one thing is great. But we've had how many years in the making of thinking we have to look a certain way. So the no. more of us that can support each other about complimenting each other that's outside not about our body but you know like I really like how you listen I thank you for showing up for me the more I hear people in my circle talk like that the more it influences me to really work continue working on these struggles that happen day to day so that's what my middle finger is up to is these fucking unreal unrealistic standards but also ending on a good note thank you to those people that help challenge that every day like my two friends did sitting there yesterday I like it And I yeah. think you're, like you're not the only one that we're, we're all exposed to these pervasive norms, societal norms that we kind of, to your point, if you don't think about it and challenge, we kind of fall into it because maybe it, it just kind of matches with how human brains are programmed in our like our our desire to scrump like rabbits right so and so then it's like if it's physical then it's about like attraction and all these things but it but we're smarter than that right i think that's one of the biggest differences between us and the rest of the animal kingdom other than us fucking up the world (laughs) which we are is that we can stop and think about it and kind of check our feelings a little bit it doesn't mean we always want to because yeah. sometimes it's fun to just go with the flow <laughs> and like feel the lust and do it but yeah like yeah. i think that's important and it has to be challenged somewhere yeah. and it has to start in our groups where we're comfortable and where we're safe and where we can reinforce what's important yeah and then you spread that outwards right i just think of all my friends that even they they just like post things on instagram and it's always like if they're guys, it's always shirtless. And yeah. I'm like, you, but you're talking about, oh, hey, everyone have a great day. Okay, why the fuck do you have to be shirtless <laughs> okay, in this Zach picture? Efron. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you're just, you're not helping. Yeah. You're making everything worse. And they're probably not thinking about it. And I'm sure they're having their own like self-judgments and stuff. So I hear you. Yeah. And I've, I, um, I know, I, I, I I'm there. I'm with you. I, just appreciate the people out there that are doing the opposite and posting like everyday normal life stuff, not feeling the pressure to put the makeup on, not feeling the pressure to cover the belly up because the belly isn't flat, not just feeling that kind of pressure. Or if they are feeling it, they're, they fucking showed up today in the crop top yeah. and, you know, felt confident or show, showed up with the shirt on and thought yeah. it's okay, right? Because it's just these feelings, like you said, they come and go. But when we see it, con- we see it more and more and more every day. And you're like, how is it that everyone has to look this way all the time when in reality, yeah. like I don't, if I actually have tried to follow that, where would the rest of my minutes and day in life go? So, you know, it's not realistic to be that way. Yeah. I just, you know, I I appreciate the people in our life that are saying, fuck that shit, man. And be you, be you, You, your roles on your dummy doesn't define you. You know what I mean? In fact, maybe it defines you in a more positive way than we think, which is you are enjoying life. And I just think I'm like you, like I'm going to struggle with these body image pieces as well, probably for the rest of my life, because it's just inherent. It's nature. So I kept it and then I have to deal with it. And where, if we can make these changes that we talk about, it's going to make it easier for like your kids and everyone else that doesn't like the younger generations that don't have to have this internal struggle, which is fucking exhausting. Yeah. 
all the time yeah. because they will now start to see that it, life is about enjoy that thing. Like if you're going to be so anguished about, oh, I ate that piece of carrot cake. Mm-hmm. Now I have to work out hard. Like it's just so self-sabotaging mm-hmm. and it's hard to break that cycle. And and I, I want to be optimistic. But the reality is if we are in our 40s and we've been fed this <laughs> down our throats, it's going to be hard to realistically think that this is going to change, you know, over 10 years, yeah. it's going to take time. But the newer generations, if we can kind of try and remove this bullshit, yeah. Yeah. then they won't have to struggle with it so yeah. much. They can focus on other things like writing poetry or, yeah. I don't know, weird trigonomic calculations <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, right? it's things that they were meant to. And I, I have a lot of faith too in the younger generation. I, I agree with you. I think how some of these young kids are growing up in comparison to when we were that age there, I feel in a very different place. And I can also appreciate that some of them would say, you don't, you guys don't know, you don't understand. Like they are growing in a different world than we grew up in. And they're right about that. Uh, However, the typical developmental things, it doesn't matter who you are. We all go through, you know, finding our identity at 12, 13, and it goes in different ways. I just see them being more outspoken and yeah. just so much more supportive. Like my son is 12 and he has this group of friends that they say things like, I love you, or they hug each other, or they go support Aww. each other at each other's That's ex. Awesome. Like one was in a play. And so they all went and supported him and and just seeing wow. them interact and you think, A, boys, B, 12-year-old boys, you think, oh, these guys are more open to talking in the way that they process the Barbie movie in comparison to maybe boys that I grew up with that age would have, right? And I know times change and it's not fair to be like, our generation is shitty. It's not, it's things were different at that time too. And we were all kind of conformed to whatever was happening. However, yeah, Yeah. these young, these young ones, definitely, I think there's a lot of hope with them with pushing back in a way that, you know, Maybe I'll regret it when my son's going to start pushing back in a couple of years as an adolescent. But uh, right now, I'm very appreciative. So we kind of like just talking a little bit about our identity and growing up. Maybe maybe this is a good time to invite you to talk a little bit about what childhood was like for you. And, you know, at the yeah. beginning of this, we talked about let's start at the beginning of conversations. So if I'm going to yeah. learn about some of your struggles as well as how – how those struggles have shaped who you are today, then let's start about what was childhood like for yeah. you, my friend? How, how would you how would you describe it when you think about your childhood? What would you say were some early influences for you? Yeah, for sure. I love it. It's kind of, again, not to, not to pull in drag, but it's kind of like in RuPaul when she pulls up the picture of, you know, you as a kid and what would you say to yourself? And, yeah. and maybe that's coming to... Yeah, like start there. Yeah, kid, go for I, it. I, I was overweight, so I was constantly struggling with my weight as a kid, and I would say that is one of the most defining challenges, struggles of my childhood. To the point that, like, my best friend would make fun of me. And mm. can you imagine, like, best friend is saying things like, "You have tits." No, I mean developed. And that's the first time I've said that in years mm. because I, it just. Like I'm getting the shivers thinking yeah. about it because it was just such a dick thing to say. And I mean, to the contrary, what you said, like kids, are, your son and his friends are so great. And I'm like, yeah, and kids can also be shit. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you then, believe that because those people are shaping who you are at that age. So yeah. what, whether your mom yeah. or your siblings were like, you're the most beautiful thing in the world, it does not matter because that friend is yeah. it's going to mean way more what they say. So yeah, you've already now totally. agreed with your friend that, yeah, that's right. I do. I do have yeah. this problem. I am big. Totally. And I mean, I had some pictures as a kid, like people will often say like later in life, oh, I can't believe you were ever overweight as a kid. Cause you know, I, I'm a little more in shape. I put on a few pounds now, but anyways, it's so weird for me to think back to that now, actually, but it, define me and it's interesting because a lot of gay men from what i've learned and who i've met over the years they've a lot of them have been chubby kids Mm -hmm. so it's almost like like, and i'm not saying this is a cause and effect if yeah if your kid is yeah you're gonna be gay don't go put your kids on diets now like where (laughs) this is yeah (laughs) exactly but uh it's just an interesting like 
yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe? Right? Yeah. That, that's the biggest thing. Like, and I, I grew up, it's interesting, like, as we talked a little bit before about people of color and, and immigration to Canada a little bit. I was a product of an immigrant family in the sense that my dad's family was German and they escaped East Germany after the war and then, you know, took a boat over that took a month. You know, they were poor. So it was under the quarters. I think Titanic, like where Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. was. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kate Winslet. yeah. And so that kind of shaped me too, just in the sense that it was this work ethic. It yeah. was, you know, they came from nothing. They worked hard. They work their butts off to save money to like, you know, buy a property and then buy a lake lot, which was, you know, things were more affordable back then than they are now. But that also kind of shaped who I was. So I also, interestingly, another thing would be like, I, I'm half German, half English, but I identify more with my German side and maybe because it's different, right? Yeah. Like you think of kind of, you talked about North America kind of being white settlers yeah. and, um, or colonizers, maybe yeah. a, a more appropriate word. That was just the norm. So German was a little bit different. So yeah. I, um, yeah, kind of identified more with that. And I grew up listening to my Oma and Opa speak German. So I yeah. got an ear for it. In fact, my dad like failed grade one because he didn't speak enough English or something right. like that. So yeah, so it, it was an interesting childhood. I did a lot of sports, played hockey, which was kind of a typical thing. So when you when you were playing <laughs> hockey, though, like as a boy, what... No. What was that culture like at your age too, playing hockey? Because ma yeah. many of us hear now about the hockey culture and a lot of sports athletes and players are coming out and talking about some of the struggle right. struggles back then too, being accepted. So there was a lot yeah. of, you know, you had to hide a lot of who you were. Did you, did you know yeah. that at that point? Did you know you were gay at that point? Did you like, how, how was that for you playing hockey as a boy who's yeah. being told he has these tits from his friend and then yeah. also figuring out like, what, who am I? Yeah. That's a very dominant culture, right? Those kids, yes. the kids playing hockey, they're, they're tough kids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Did and you I identify think I, okay, as one of those kids? No, I think I was a bit. So I didn't come out until my 21. So I played hockey from like six years old till 14. I think I played for eight years. I quit because I wanted to get a job at McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have money, right? Yeah. And buy things. So I was a younger kid. So like we only started hitting, I think, in Pee Wee. I just like I was a big kid, like a big defenseman. And I always found it hard to be aggressive and mean. Like, that's not my nature. Yeah. So, But that so would be I your shift, right? That'd be your position that you'd have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that might have also added to, like, eventually being like, I don't, I don't need to play oh, yeah. hockey for the rest of my life. It, which is interesting. Now I feel like I would be a different person on the ice. Like, right? yeah. I've grown into myself more. I'm more competitive. I wasn't competitive as a kid. Yeah, like ho hockey was just fun for me. I enjoyed it. But again, I didn't feel as rambunctious as the other kids. I was more of a softy, yeah. if I can say. So, it, and, and it, the mentality of, you know, kind of what you hear in locker rooms and how difficult it is for anyone that identifies as part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community, it's a mouthful, <laughs> is wasn't really around when I was there. And maybe because it was earlier. But yeah, so it didn't really play a part for me growing up. Yeah. Yeah, you know? that's fair. I think I think that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I think it, it was a good thing for sure. Like nowadays, I'm sure it's earlier. Like kids are learning and and figuring out who they are earlier. Like I just knew I, I knew I was different. Yeah. And I didn't know why. But I do have this interest. <laughs> so I kind of laugh. You know how you remember certain things that like just pop in your mind that maybe they're defining moments. And so for me, and I don't, I hope I don't get tarred and feathered for this, but something that I remember was as a kid, like entering adolescence, I was thinking of women's breasts. Oh. And for some reason, I felt shame about it and that I shouldn't. And so I was like, okay, I have to stop thinking about women's breasts. What am I going to think about? And I was, men, I'll think about men. And it stopped me from thinking about women's breasts. Yeah. And then, I don't know, later on, I just like started thinking about or realizing I was like fantasizing about people in the shower, like guys in the shower right. 
not for my hockey team, but yeah. like my brother was with their hockey team. Yeah. Anyways, this is like getting real deep and maybe a, a little but, too no. personal. But it's, like, it's I only no as deep as you want it to go, right? I mean, I think what you're yeah. talking about though is like, yeah, we have those pop up moments yeah. that you're right. There is a certain time point, like later on, where we connect to and we're like, oh, I had those memories and maybe I should lean into it and figure out, or you know why you're like, okay, I yeah. know why I I'm that pop-up moment is coming up. Would you say, yeah. well, when we, at that time, when you were like feeling disrespectful, thinking of women, would you say when you look back at was 14, the age where you started to realize that you, that, that difference that you felt was because you liked boys or did you feel that you knew you were different was nothing to do with the liking boys. It was something else. Looking back, for sure, I would say it has to do with being gay. gay. At the time, for sure, I didn't know what it was. And I think part of it, too, is it's hard to know what you identify with or what you might be if you have no exposure to it. Yeah. So, like, my my family is very supportive of me. There were homophobic things that were said in the house all the time because that's just what was said back then. It was normal. And I never took offense to it. I mean, at some point when I came out in my when I was 21, was I, did, was I a little bit worried? For sure. So there might have been some subconscious planting in my mind of, of what would potentially happen when I come mm. out. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was interesting, yeah. but it was, it wasn't a huge, a huge thing. What made you come out at 21? So I had met people and a person that I was attracted to, who's a friend to this day. And that's what kind of made me realize like I started hanging out with them and they were gay and and I realized I was gay at that point so I came out to a really good friend of mine who was straight you may have met him Tyler he used to live in Calgary oh yeah yeah Yeah. I was just like in the mic being like oh yeah 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 I did meet Tyler didn't you guys live together no but he lived in Calgary and I hung out with him all the time and it's very likely you would have met him yeah because we were hanging out so yeah. So I confided in him and I was like, I told him I was gay. And then I said, you know, there's this guy I really like, but, uh, you know, I don't want to tell him. And he said, you know, you'd be surprised at what people will think or who might like you if if you just tell them, which was pretty profound at the moment. And I, of course, I'm not remembering the words exactly. Yeah. I remember how I felt, which was supported. Yeah. And I came out to this guy and he was also gay. That was it. I was like, oh, I like this guy, but I don't even know if he's gay. And he's like, you'd be surprised if you, you know, and he turned out to be gay. And then we started hanging out and the rest is history. But yeah, so that's kind of how that happened. It was all around a little history moment. We had the 2001 World Track and Field Mm. in Edmonton. It was the first time outside of or in North America that we hosted this huge event, which was big in Europe, but not big in North America. And I joined to perform in the opening ceremonies. And that's kind of how this all happened. I met them because they were in the opening ceremonies too. Surprise, surprise, performance attracts gay people. <laughs> like, what were you, like, what, what, what did you do? What were you performing? So it was like an opening number. There were a bunch of like dance groups and then there oh, okay. were these tribal cool. groups as well. So we all had like, there were four colors, yellow, green, blue, and red. And I was part of the red tribe and and so there were like the masculine men that had tribal paint on them and sticks and we were doing these stick routines and then there were dancers with anyways it was funny because there were (laughs) there were so many butch men and not all of them were gay some of them were for sure straight but they fit the stereotype that you know, maybe not the most coordinated, not necessarily the best at remembering dance routines. So the choreographer had to keep dumbing down oh. our choreography <laughs> because they couldn't get it. <laughs> and they're like, shit, we still have this opening number we have to do. Like, we, it, it has to happen. So if we need to cut this out, we're going to cut it out. Right, like, right. <laughs> but, oh, my God, this is so funny. Like, this is uh, how stereotypes are for, <laughs> you know. No doubt. So, eh? yeah. um, so yeah. you you mentioned for you, your family has been supportive. And, and I know that since I've known you, you've talked so highly of your whole family. And I'm curious when you did come out and tell them at, at that age, was it still, was it relatively close? Like after you talked to your friend, is that when you went and talked to your family? Like how did that process go? And yeah. how did they receive that? Yeah, for sure. So between when I first 
told my friend and then when I told my family was for sure within a year's time or less. Yeah. Probably less. And it was funny. I told my mom at dinner. Well, my whole family was having dinner and I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell them then. And then I, I had plans that night to go out with fr- the friends, the gay friends that I had met. And so it was nice because I had this out. Like I didn't have to, I was like, okay, if this goes well or not well, I get to peace out and go, you know, yep. have some separation and everyone can kind of process it. It's a good plan. Yeah. So I told them at dinner and then my mom was, are you sure? Yeah. And my dad and my dad, who my dad growing up, he's a journeyman electrician. Like he worked in Fort McMurray doing all of the, you know, all the things and grew up in a very strict German household. And so I literally thought that my dad might kill me in my sleep. And this was obviously taking it to the nth degree in my own head. And so when my mom was like, are you sure? My dad was like, of course he's sure. Oh. And then later that night or a different night, he I was watching TV and he came down. And my dad is, you can be close in presence, but you don't talk about your feelings. Like kind of typical, whatever, gen, not Gen X, but the generation before that, especially coming from like a stern German family. And he was like, you know, it takes a lot of courage to tell us and all this. And and it was so sweet. And like, I... I was like, fuck, I totally pegged him wrong. Like, I felt a little bit embarrassed about that. Mm. And my mom, it was funny because she was, somehow I always knew. And I was like, well, you could have told me because I had <laughs> no idea why I was feeling different and stuff. So <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. We hear that. We hear that in TV shows or we hear people say, yeah, I feel like I've known. I've known this yeah. about you. And that's interesting because... I mean, moms seem to know their kids pretty darn well. Sometimes we're annoyed at how well our moms know us. Uh, So on one hand, you're like, it's believable. But on the other hand, it's interesting. Yeah, when you, like a mom of young boys right now, they're figuring their stuff out. Like I said, one's 12. So he's entering that identity place. And so there's so much that we don't know. And purposefully, I don't explore with him because I think it's for him to start to figure out. And, you know, you see their friends, they're all developmentally similar. And so some are interested in dating and some have talked about being bisexual. Some have talked about uh, being gay. And so there's all sorts of different conversations they're having. And, and so you wonder, right, where's your son at? And so you, you lay out these little yeah. moments where you're like, okay, I hope that they, he feels he can share whatever is going on for him, whether he likes girls or not, or boys or whoever, or both. I don't know. I don't care. I just want my kids to feel like they can come and share that information. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. something that our generation has picked up from what's lacked uh, the generation yeah. before because of like you shared yeah. where your family, where your dad yeah. comes from, where our parents come from. And you, there's all sorts of not, not saying it was good or bad or uh, we agree or disagree as we talked about at the beginning. It's just that's yeah. their context that they're showing up with yeah. and knowing yeah. that is helpful. And so I, I with you am also, you know, I don't, I'm a little embarrassed to say too, but like surprised at the way you described your dad to when you share how he came out and and his response and honestly kudos to him kudos to a man in that generation coming from where he's coming to know that the best thing to do is to go have that follow-up with my son like how i would imagine that you would probably pull that moment high in your your relationship uh, continuum i would imagine right yeah absolutely and he's had a few moments where that's been the case like back to the body image thing like I remember my brother making fun of me and he said something really hurtful one time uh, like kids do and it was my birthday coming up and I don't think he'd be upset because kids like brothers yes and siblings have horrible rivalries sometimes and my family was like what do you want for your birthday and I was like I'm not sure and my brother's like I know and he I was like, oh, what, what is it? And he's like a training bra, ha, 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 like going, you know, so again, another thing. And I just like burst out in tears, ran upstairs and my dad came up and he was the one who kind of consoled me again. So like my dad has done this a few times as I think about this more and more, like he, he's like that strong, silent type. If I can say that, I know maybe that's a bit toxic, but it's true for him. It fits the bill for him. And so. Yeah, so I was very, uh, very impressed 
with what he said. I felt awkward, of course, because I'm like, this isn't like I haven't really seen like we don't really talk yeah. about our feelings. Yeah. But, but I knew it was like it was nice. It was received very well. Yeah. And I will say one thing though, just as you're talking about, you know, wanting to have a safe space for your yeah. children, your sons to be able to express what they want when they want. And I've had this conversation with a good friend of mine whose brother came out too. And and as much as you may want to ask someone, and this is just me coming from my experience, it can be different for different people for sure. But I wasn't ready to tell other people till I was ready to accept it myself. Yeah. And so when people try and pull it out of someone, and if they're not ready, that's possibly the worst thing you could do to them, right? And so it's important to let them know. And I would think, and not that you are soliciting or had asked me for advice or tips, but I would say if there's any way, like, you know how I said when I grew up, I heard homophobic things that made me feel that, okay, this is, you know, my family maybe feels this way about gay people. So if you can do the opposite and just be like, oh, I had a podcast with my friend Mike who's gay and this was exciting and not just matter of fact, then they'll start to see, oh, mom talked about this and she was totally cool with it, which they make these deductions, right? That is is very valuable, I think, in so many realms of parenting or even in creating a safe space. Sometimes we have relationships, friends or kids, you're right, we will say things like, I'm not racist or I'm an open mom, you know, I'm, I'm open to all these things. And we lay these statements out. But what I hear you saying is don't fight that and say that, show it, show it by yeah. not having discriminatory conversations, show it by when you see, you know, we love modern family in our house. My kids love that show. Yeah. And when you watch it, it's fantastic. But also there's things that they say on that show that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they're, you know, they got away with some of that stuff. But, you know, we talk about yeah. Mitch, Mitch and Cam on there all the time. Yeah. But but so there's always these opportunities, I think, when we're watching TV or something is said in social media to, you're right, like think about, okay, what, how do Carrie and I want to respond to this by not saying something or saying something that you're right, these kids are listening to and can think, okay, My parents are comfortable with these sorts of things because that's just it. Like, I only hope that my kids feel safe to come to us at any time. But like you said, it's what kind of environment are we? What kind of environment, right? Are are, are we creating? And I I remember I shared this a while back. My son, same one, 12-year-old, quite a few months ago, did a PowerPoint presentation for Carrie and I about why he should be allowed to get a dog because we I haven't this. yeah okay yeah because we we yeah. didn't get one after we lost caster and i just you know wanted needed some time and yeah. and thought okay having a pet would be like having another child so he's been on us since doing this presentation but in that presentation what stood out to carrie and i is he he said you guys sometimes comment on how i'm fat and so having having this dog will allow me to exercise and walk it and work on that and so in the end, before we even responded to him, like, yeah, we we went back and we still talk about that. Like, fuck, we're like, we never once said any of that. And the realization was a lot of what you're saying is like, sometimes you don't have to say things, but the yeah. feeling and the thought or that, yeah. you know, that message is still there. And when yeah. when we have unconscious biases, when we, you know, have a lack of awareness or, you know, we're distracted by other things, we can miss a lot of these. And that was a really yeah. important life lesson for us as parents about never underestimate that these kids aren't watching or listening, like you said. Yeah. And I think as parents, we worry about saying the right thing. But I just want to make sure I'm being clear because I really am I'm taking in what you're saying, like that you're right about it's just being able to create that silent, safe space so our kids know yeah. that, oh, yeah, I can call my parents when I'm stuck at a party. And because yeah. every other time I've called them, they haven't answered with what or annoyed or whatever. Right. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's things like that. So, yeah, it's a lot. And it's, it's hard to, you know, be prepared for everything. And I think this goes to like every conversation we've had today and others for sure. It's about the intent. Yeah. And also it's about just thinking, how will this be perceived? Because to your point, you, what 
Xander was saying in his presentation for the dog and maybe being overweight and you're like, Karen, I never said that he was overweight or whatever. If I'm understanding the story correctly, you might have said something completely different, but he interpreted it a different way. And you can't control every way that someone is going to interpret something, but it is an interesting learning like, oh shit, I can see how he took it this way because of XYZ, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 Like you we yeah. were worried about his diet, right? Like that's what it comes to your teenagers and te- we've all been there. We know how teenagers eat. And so as a parent, you're worried about the diet and what is the first thing, you know, failure of parenting. I always say unfollow yeah. me for the best parenting tips is we, <laughs> we get so worried and fearful. And so then we like obsess over this idea of you better eat healthy. How many how many fishy crackers did you eat today? Did, did you did yeah. you did what is that six granola bars now? And so when we're fussing over it in that way, yeah, we're not openly saying, hey, kid, we're worried about you gaining weight or you being unhealthy. But all these other things that we've said have helped him reach that place. Okay, so like, you know, we're talking about your childhood and you're talking about growing up and the, some of the body image seems to be like something that sort of came up for you at an early age. Yeah. And it's interesting because you also shared earlier that you're, you did nutrition and you're a dietitian. So is yeah. there a connection there, picking that career in, in body image? Or did you just... It's a good point. I've actually never thought of that, <laughs> which is really quite funny. But it's funny you say that because... So I fell into nutrition. It it feels like I actually fell into it because I loved cooking. I took like foods and home ec and junior high and high school. And I actually wanted to be a chef. And when I learned that in order to get into university, I had to drop foods. I like I had a crisis. I was crying. My parents were like, oh, my God. And you know, realizing you don't really go to university to become a chef, you go to like Nate or Sate, right? And you go to a technical institute and learn these things. But I I just wanted it all. So maybe my direction wasn't refined enough. (laughs) Um, But I do remember, and maybe it's not the case anymore, but there was some sort of statistic around people that go into nutrition being more hyper aware of maybe body image and and the like Mm. this was a while ago so you know as a professional referencing science i probably should have it a little more accurate (laughs) to say it but i i do remember that in the background so there probably is some sort of subconscious gravitational pull that takes you yeah in some of those directions right so yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you when you look back now at your struggles with your body and some of the messages you were getting, what were there any influences or role models that would like combat that for you or that you could look to or you felt like you had? I would say I didn't have positives, and I think it's A little complex in the sense that as I started, so I, you know, grew up with the background of like being overweight, being made fun of from people that were close to me. My brother is really nice now, by the way. If he he comes across this podcast, sorry, bro, but you're good now. As I was struggling with body image, I also started to realize and then came out. Right. So, and something that happens to, from my understanding, and again, I might not be totally accurate on this, but for my experience and other friends of mine, when you come out and I was a late bloomer, so I came out at 21. So when people are normally experimenting and starting to have relationships, perhaps in their teens and and late teens, that didn't happen for me until my early twenties. And so you're kind of set back a little bit, right? So as I'm now in my early 20s, I'm out, I am, you know, starting to act on my sexual interests in the same sex and and that sort of thing. Then you have this body image issue and the physicality. So it all just kind of combines to be like, look at the men's health magazines, Mm -hmm. look at the muscle model magazines and the physiques. And so it just kind of you know, it's the mm-hmm. wrong place at the right time to really reinforce unhealthy behaviors. And I think in our community, it's getting a lot better, but there still is, depending on what you have access to, which is literally everything nowadays, yeah. you can reinforce these unhealthy behaviors of people who make a living off of, not unlike you with a podcast, but for them, it's it's physical fitness. And mm-hmm. it's like how amazing they look, but you don't realize they probably hate their life because they 
they have to be so strict and regimented. And maybe they don't have, hate their life. I hope they don't. Yeah. But I just know, like, when I met Sean, I was in the best shape I ever was. Poor him. Now I'm not <laughs> Now I'm not there. But I like to think I make up for it in other ways. But I knew at that moment that it wasn't sustainable. I was like, the amount of work and discipline I had to have for this meant not having a drink with friends that night, not having that snack at night, being really strict on going to the gym. And while it's important to be healthy, what's the mental health toll and what is what are you missing out on in life? And so, sorry, this is kind of like a whole thing. No, I'm loving where you're going. Keep going. But yeah, so that's like kind of where I came to this point of what is sustainable, what's realistic, what's going to fill my cup and make me feel happy, especially you had mentioned earlier, and I've experienced the two friends that have passed away way too early. Mm-hmm. And it's like, fuck, if I died tomorrow, would I have been happy that I had a six pack? Yep. Or would I have been happy that I went to high tea and ate desserts, or I took a baking class and, and I made cinnamon buns that are freaking amazing? Or you know what I mean? Yeah, I had do. a few drinks and danced through the night. It's this contradiction or like a, a thing that we deal with, right? Where's the balance? Yeah. Just like balance in the other aspects of our life. But where's the balance on this? And for me, it wavers. It goes back and forth and I struggle with it. And I need to get better at for myself, not thinking, well, I'm never, I'm never going to get to where I want to be focusing more on when people want to get healthy, they want to lose weight. And I always used to tell people who ever wanted to ask me, I'm not sure why, but <laughs> I said, focus on enjoying being healthy, like having more energy, sleeping better, not did the scale needle mm-hmm. move down pounds because that's not what you want. It's the quality of life, right? Yeah. So. You said so many things that really resonated with me and hopefully with others too. One of the things I want to go back to is when you were talking about men's magazine and Shamar Moore came up for me because that time he was like the the health guy from the soap operas, always on the cover with his like eight pack on these magazines. And while this sort of issue is being created in the man's world with these men's health magazines and all this, we are already seeing it and feeling it with the women. Like that's the one area for girls we've been able to call out and talk about for years. When yes. Jenny Craig first came out even, like there was, there's always, because it's always been targeted towards women. The the housewife that gained the weight, got to lose the weight, babies make us gain weight, all these kinds of things. And so for you, though, it's like this the silent thing that's happening for, for boys in particular, because you guys are also, not all of you, but in your case, one of those boys that's possibly developing these body image issues that are going to impact your health as you get older. And yet we're not recognizing it because boys are strong and boys are meant to be athletes yeah. and, you know, all those sorts of things. When you look yeah. back now... What is one thing that you feel we can get better at to bridge that gap or help educate people about body image issues that, you know, we didn't really tend to for young boys or look at for boys? Is there something that you think we could be doing different? It's a good question. I don't know if I have a really good finger on the pulse for where we're at now. I I think for me, it's just, it's having those conversations. It's having access and the media, which is more of a challenge, right? But to to change the narrative of what the role models are that we look at, to have more postings or people on the front of GQ that perhaps don't have a V-shaped figure, don't have abs or bulging biceps or, you know what I mean? Like, let's normalize the range of body shapes and let's, because it's, I I'm not convinced I'll ever get past what's been put in my head and Mm -hmm. I'll be struggling for the rest of my life. Right. But if you do it early enough, you will change the needle. Mm -hmm. It it will move because it's all about what's normalized. You don't know what you don't know. And if this is all you've ever known, it's hard to change. Yeah. It's a, it, you're right. It's a it's a good point. Not because, an easy answer. No, I think that's a fair answer. And I and I agree with you as like starting as young as we can and educating ourselves and just even going back to the middle fingers up segment when we we can A, not live in isolation and hope that we have somewhat of a community. And then B, if th- somewhat of that community has at least one person in there, like those two friends that I mentioned last night that on yeah. their own 
picked up on something. They know me. They know what I struggle with. And, yeah. you know, we we leak our issues out all the time on our friends, whether we want to intentionally say I'm struggling with body image issues or most of the time we leak. Oh, look at me. Don't delete that picture. No, I don't want to get in it. I'm fat, whatever it is that we say. But when you have someone in our in your community that challenges that, I think it goes to what you were saying too, like having people that challenge our way of thinking in our corner is helpful to help us grow. And I, I think yeah. that's been helpful for me as well over the years while I know I can always rely on myself to be self-compassionate with myself in this area, um, yeah. I've been able to find some people in, in my area that can help challenge that. And they're not always people that are going to say, you look amazing today. No, there are people that uh, we're going to you know, get into conversations with that say, why does that matter? Like, why, yeah. why, why do why we have to point that out? Look? Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to be. It could be, I love your energy today. Or, yeah. Yeah. You know, it can be a lot of different things. It doesn't, right. we, we have to stop focusing on how you look. And that tends to be the first thing. Oh my God, I love. And I said that about your hair. Oh, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I think it was before we did the, but again, it, it's about the physical appearance. And so I say that because it's not, it's not an easy thing to change yeah. to break the cycle. Yeah. But that's where it needs to happen. And I wanted to go back quickly to something that you said just as part of your example. And that's, oh, I don't like how I look in this picture, delete it. Mm-hmm don't post it. You know what? If we posted more of those pictures that we didn't necessarily like, we're not editing ourselves to fit this narrative Mm -hmm. that is already out there. If we start to post these, oh, I don't really like how I look. You know what? This is, I need to post this because now I'm starting to normalize that we can have on days, off days, or maybe I actually look good, but for whatever reason, I'm not seeing it or mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Oh, hundred like, percent. Well, it's, just, it's also like, that's the way I look. <laughs> like yeah, I, I exactly. want to delete the way I look. And that's the message that, you know, we, we day to day, we send ourselves those negatives and somebody like it really stood out to me. They, they taught me about, you know, they say this and you can do this in relationships, but I've been using this like in all aspects of my life. These you have, you have this like metaphor of a bank and you find ways to put pod, positive deposits in your bank. So like for yeah. you and your husband, when you take care of each other or Sean supporting your the drag culture, that's you yeah. two having positives in your real bank. And that when something yeah. shitty happens, you have more positives to draw out to help you. And so yeah. I've been trying to do the same with personal, like, okay, how do I put some of those positives in this bank? So many of us, and I'm sure you know this too, how many times in a day do you have dialogue that no one has heard, only you have, but it's now going to sit with you all day because you got out of the shower, you saw the roll, then you feel guilty for the shitty thing you ate, you didn't go to the gym, that person over there looks so hot in that outfit, whatever it is that creates these image issues for us. And then we, we stay with that, right? And so I've been trying to do these positive self deposits to, to help me kind of change my script from, okay, I go and work out now I'm in my forties and I'm, yes, I still want to look good. I like fashion, but now looking good for me is really remembering what the feeling of being good is. So when I feel good, I look good, you know? So it, like you said, we have good days, we have bad, right? We have moments, you know, like maybe you have an example of something that you try to do to fight that, that body image stigma. I, I think, what really resonates with me is what you said about it's not about liking how you look but liking how you feel Mm. and if you like how you feel you everything else falls into place and that's absolutely what i try and focus on i do know that you know there's the runner's high after you run so that and i also think there's kind of the gym high after you have a good workout and that's there's always a high after you have sex too so Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or eating the cupcake. That's a high too. So I think it's just being kind to yourself. And you mentioned earlier, and I totally believe in this, but, and I think no one would disagree. Like the human body is amazing at what it does. If you like, the more you learn about like, just like atoms and chemical structures and our bodies are made up of this. And then they have all these signals and hormones and all these things like, so if you if we could live more in the awe of what our body actually does and not that it needs to look a certain way, but to your point, also healthy aging and being able to walk upstairs and do hikes in the mountains like you can because you're so close to real mountains. But anyways. <laughs> yeah, come on back here. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. We'll do that. It just it makes it easier to focus on the other things in life, right? Like yeah. That. 
So that's what I try. That's what I try and do. It's something I need to continue to do. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, hopefully I can keep that focus. But you're right. You have good days. You have bad yeah. days too. And yeah. it's it's okay to have those. Just acknowledge it and, and do the best that you can. And if anything, I would say if you have these unhealthy things, like you have that picture in your pantry and maybe you don't even look at it anymore, which is probably why it's still there and you <laughs> forgot to take it down. But like try and remove those yeah. things that are reinforcing negativity or these negative constructs. I think are probably the best place to start. Yeah. You know, and you probably can't do a cold turkey. You probably have to like wean it off, right? Right. So what do you, what do you, when you have hard days or hard moments and maybe you look, you're looking in the mirror or you're driving in the car and you catch a glimpse of yourself or whatever part of your body that bothers you the most, you're interacting with that. What are, what are some, messages that you've been able to give yourself or what what is like some self-compassion that you've been able to give yourself to help you kind of get over that or you know bounce back quicker maybe not be stuck in that place of thinking poorly about that body part or that part of yourself like are there examples of self-compassion and how you've helped yourself get out of that moment it's something that I definitely struggle with and the best thing that I can say, and this is this is more for me to like remind myself of what I could do, is to to get yourself out of that that vicious cycle or that thought process, right? So to think of something differently or change your focus, go do something else, to clear your mind. Don't give it the space that it will take yeah. and continue to take, and you'll spiral or ruminate on it. Because if you can take if you think of it like a fire and you're giving it oxygen by thinking about it, remove the oxygen and the oxygen is like focus on something else. Yeah. And then it's, so it's more deflection, I think, or, yeah. or just, yeah, changing your, your thought. It's not easy. Yeah. I don't think it's easy to do, but the first step is recognizing it, right? Yeah. Like if you don't even recognize you're doing it, you can't make the change. So when did you first get to that place where you're like, Oh, I gotta be nicer to myself. Do you remember that? Uh, Honestly, and this is so sad, but it it would be when I was doing yoga more regularly. I don't know. I just always had this like feeling when partway through when you've exerted some energy. and, And I think that's part of the practice is my understanding. I haven't done yoga in a while, partly, well, for various reasons, but that's where I think I've learned to really love my body. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I do. know about you. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I was like, shoot, sometimes be careful when you ask something cuz yeah. you might get you might get the question, what about you? You know, I think there's been different there's been moments in in time, but I think probably for me would be recent would be when I entered 40. It's like a it's relatively new for me. I think I was in denial and I thought I was handling how I was managing my body image stuff well for years because you get compliments when you're skinny and you get the opposite when you put your cheeks are a little bigger, right? And so then you just, it perpetuates the sickness. You're like, well, I'm going to keep doing what I got to do to stay skinny because people like me like this. But then I think when I hit my 40s, I don't know, it was like, it's so hard to describe, but this like relief kind of, I started to figure out what my values were, what I believed in. And and I started to do some work about finding like my voice. And I'm, I'm realized like my voice, my identity was like looking a certain way. And a lot of people made fun of that, bugged me. Like oh. I had a lot of friends, we would oh, joke and I kind of helped create that too. Like, oh, you're just so pretty. At least you're pretty. <laughs> you know, like we'd have yeah. these and I would love that. I'm like, yeah, at least I'm pretty. And then hitting 40, I think I was like, what the fuck am I talking about? And how? why am I talking to myself yeah. this way? I can't, yeah. I can't do this. And I think when Xander had that presentation, like in the last year, that was a... The reminder for Carrie and I of, yeah, we got to we gotta look at how we address weight and health in our house. And that, that's, yeah. that includes a lot of things, right? Like lots of stuff comes with health. It's not just weight. Weight was one of them. So I, I, and like you said, it's, it's hard. I definitely am not an s- ambassador or spokesperson. I'm just someone that's like you trying to figure out if there's more of us in this boat of we have had really shitty moments in life where body has meant more than anything else. 
I think yeah. if we start to talk about it, then maybe we can start to figure out, okay, like how do we, like you said, like how do we manage it better? Because it's not going to go away how many years yeah. in the making to how many years in the unmaking. But to have someone yeah. like you sitting before me and also like being a man, I... I've been doing, I've done a few of these, as I told you, these body image episodes, and yep. it's very hard to invite men on that want to relate or connect, okay. you know, to body image. I think women are way more willing to talk about it and the struggles. Yep. And I think part of that is because we're starting to see women in media, women in our lives start to rescript what that means and what right. being healthy is. And I just don't know if that's in the same world for men. Like I don't, I don't know men influencers out there. I don't really know a whole lot of men out there that a are willing to come out and talk about this. But definitely, as I've been trying to get men on the body image stuff, it's been hard. I wonder why. Like it's as you're saying that, I, it it makes sense why women might be more willing because it's been around for so long. Yeah. And you're, I feel like women are, if I can say this, really starting to take ownership of it and yeah. and change the narrative. Whereas I feel like for men, and I'm also in a bit of a subsect of that being a gay man. And and part of me thinks it might even be worse mm. as a gay male, like the, the focus and the pressure to be perfect in a way, like physically. Yeah. So I wonder if it's still ramping up in, in the men's world, yeah. if you will. Uh, and so people are... I don't know. I'm still just surprised that people wouldn't be willing to talk about it. Like, yeah, like, I mean, maybe that's a question to folks yeah. listening. Like, if if you know the answer, if you can help us start to figure out, or if if you're a man out yeah. there that wants to, like, you know, be part of this movement where creating dialogue in space to talk about these issues, yeah. please tell us or join us or help us maybe figure out like what it is that we can do to create a safe place because. Yeah. I was just in awe when I reached out to you and how quickly you were like, oh my gosh, yes. Uh, because I thought, oh, f f yay. Because to me, I'm so curious about men's health and raising boys growing yeah. up with, you know, around men in my community too. And it, there are so many things we can do to ta tackle some of toxic masculinity, yeah. but also helping in the world of men's health and in the South Asian community, I'm like, if we can support that, then maybe there's less domestic violence. Maybe there's less addictions. Maybe relationships yeah. can be salvaged. And also like as a woman who has space to be able to cry openly, like I would, I, I only hope that for my boys, right. To feel like it doesn't yeah. matter if they're a man or a woman, they can be in a conversation and not feel like yeah. they have to tuck away that emotion. But the same with body yeah. image, it's like, I know there's a lot of men out there when we go to Mexico, we go to the pool, will you know, not take their shirt off. We see it because I'm one of those women also wearing my shirt at the pool with you. You saw me, I saw you. But like maybe yeah. next time we can, you know, connect if we're at the pool and I'm wearing my shirt, you're wearing your shirt or like two dudes. Like there's, there's a reason why we're wearing our shirt and yeah, we don't want to get sunburned, but often it's because... We're, we're not comfortable. Yeah, right? We don't want to be vulnerable in that way. And that's okay if you don't want to show it. But if it's because we think we have to look a certain way, you know, maybe yeah. people like yourself, right? We can we can push that a little more. Yeah, I agree. It's funny when you said the whole shirt at the pool. Yeah. It reminded me when I was in going into high school with one of my best friends, we were looking at high schools where you have to do phys ed in grade 10, right? And part of that was swimming. Oh. And we were not comfortable. Like, I again, I was still overweight, being made fun of, and my friend was also overweight. And we were looking for high schools where swimming was not part of the phys ed requirements right. because it was so stigmatizing for us. And we almost considered this all boys high school because they didn't yeah. have that. Could you imagine as like a learning to become or realizing that I'm gay, like that might have been amazing. To be <laughs> that would have been, that would have been a, a uh, definitely like a Broadway show for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of just made me realize that how fucked up that is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck, yeah. Fucked up in the sense that we've created society's created that narrative yeah. That we would think that yeah. not fucked up that yeah. you're thinking it because of right. course you would yeah, right yeah. okay so i'm also yeah. looking at the time we haven't gotten into drake 
Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just start to kind of come to an end because you and I talked beforehand that yeah. there were topics on my mind that you were wanting to go and discuss and we did, haven't really hit all of them. And I don't want to rush this conversation. And now that you're back in my life and I'm back in your life, I feel yeah. like it's okay for me to ask, would you be willing to come back? Absolutely. Because if I was going to ask, if you didn't ask me, can I come back? <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I love it. More to talk about. Yes. <laughs> you'll okay. listen, careful what you wish. Yeah, for. All right. Yeah. Well, that's perfect because I will listen. <laughs> I, okay. I'm really glad to hear that you'll come back because I want to spend a little more time with you talking about the two S L G B T Q plus community, as well as your experience with Drake, how you got there, what's happening and some of the things as you touched on your middle fingers up, what we're seeing, the narratives we're seeing. I think yeah. the, the topic of drag is definitely been on my mind and I've been curious about things and you're a safe person to, I think, have these conversations with. So I'm glad to hear you want to come back because I didn't want to rush, you know, the next few minutes talking about yeah. Things that we really want to highlight on Middle Fingers Up. So the fact that you're willing to come back and talk a little bit more about that is great. So we'll call this part one. And then part one. Of a, of a limited edition <laughs> series. Yeah. Get yours now. Yeah. <laughs> While supplies last. <laughs> <laughs> While the topic is still relevant. Yeah. <laughs> Before he gets canceled. Yeah. <laughs> Will he or will he not have a job after? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my friend, I'm going to I'm going to ask you, is there anything that from today's now that we've de we've decided we're part 1, so is there anything from today's conversation that you want to go back to or that anything you want to add that maybe I didn't ask or you didn't have an opportunity to share? I feel like we covered a lot of ground, which is great, and we kind of went over, you know, how we met yeah. and kind of the background of me and I think that's important so that the listeners can kind of understand the perspective that I'm coming from right because yeah. I am just a voice and I think that's important and I really appreciate the space that you're giving to hear from people because that's what I try and do recognizing I have a voice but I also have privileges and and experiences that not everyone has as a cisgendered male but gay and white I know we're going to talk more in our part two, yeah. so we covered it all really well. I That's sure. great. Okay, if you can, mm -hmm. you can give our listeners a call to action, something that they can go think about or maybe do before we come back to part two. Ooh, so it's like homework yeah. going into part two. Yeah. I mean, I think there's two things. One is a takeaway would be to challenge our own thoughts and our own perspectives and before we jump to oh they're wrong or they're they're right and I, and I love what they're saying because it's the same as me just think a little bit more about is there more I can learn about or understand more because everyone's story is true from their perspective and there's lots of perspectives in a story and I think that's important and for our next topic I would say if listeners want to learn a little bit more, just do some Googling of what's showing up on your Googles on the internets, uh, what's going on in the 2SLGBTQ plus community. Maybe even, do you know what 2S stands for? Do you know what the L stands for? The Q, the plus? Everyone's at a different space. I am not an expert, and I hope no one thinks that I am based on our conversation today, but I'm happy to share my perspective and my understanding of things, and, and it may not be right for you, or it may be aligned, and both are okay, right? It's just yeah. about learning and listening and hearing, so... I thank you so much, mm. Alu. Oh, my God. You're, you said that so well. I think that's a really good takeaway, and that's a good place to pause, which is what we're going to do. So that's exciting. And for our listeners, you know these conversations are door openers, meaning we're just starting some of these conversations, meaning some of them for me are first-time conversations too, but we're on this journey to, to learn together. So let us know if there's anything that you want to add to what you're hearing with uh, Mike and I in particular today. And if there's anything you want to contribute to or add to or any topics of interest that you feel we should be focusing on, 
please let us know and get in touch with us. You know where to find us. Thank you. Also, if you are listening, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and stay tuned for more engaging discussions. We just added that last little tag there because... We're coming up. We're at a year now. So we're going to politely start asking folks to help subscribe. I know we're going to have our birthday soon. So probably already did. And this is probably coming out after our birthday, but that's okay. Okay. So I'm going to let everyone know that Mike is coming back. So you also have an opportunity to send any particular questions for him for his return. Other than that, thank you for being on today. It was really nice catching up and having the kind of conversation that we did today. Thank you. I, I love this. And I mean, we're, we're just chatting. We're just mm. old friends, kikiing, you know, getting back in touch with each other and talking about things that I think matter and are important and more important than how we look, right? Yeah. Talking about uh, important things. So, and, and part of that is obviously what we talked about. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. I look forward to part two and any of the questions that come up, bring, bring them. I, and no question is stupid. Yes. And don't be afraid to ask because that means you're engaged and it means that you're interested in learning more. And that's, that's the intent, right? We talked about intent. Yes. The intent is to learn. So won't be offended by questions. Perfect.